Okay, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Ingrid Fournier. I am uh, the branch manager at Scottville Library and uh, work with Robin Seymour, who was the is the director of the adult. Um, I always do that adult services. And so together we were working to do this B series and Julia the Chambers grac graciously said that she would be a speaker for us because the B series was started um, last month with introduction to bees and um, had a wonderful turnout for that. And then Julia is doing native planting to attract pollinators. And that was for folks who thought not everybody wants to be a beekeeper because uh, it's a little bit of a step to do that. But certainly lots of people are interested in planting native plants to attract pollinators. Really lucky Julia here. Julia, for those of you that don't know Julia, um, which I think most ever, yeah, she has been on a mission to educate others about protecting the earth and habitants for most of her life. She managed the Great Lakes Interpreter Center at the state park, um, where she developed many programs to accomplish that goal. And she was for 26 years, an elementary art teacher, um, elementary and art education at Manistee Hub Schools. She wove that passion um, in her class and in the after school programs. She owned a small lands company for 15 years wow. and promoted native plants and organic facilities. And in 1990, she co founded Few, which is the Few Friends of the Environment of the with Kate study in order to end this is so happy that you are fighting that fight for all of us and we're jumping on board with you. She lives her grown children and three grandkids. She does love to garden, hike, dance, travel in her spare I, I, uh, she last year uh, was the runner up of the National Cox Cons um, Conserves Heroes Award, which was a oh. huge honor. Um, and so we're lucky to have her in letting We're really lucky to have her at the library tonight. So I'm turning it over to we thank you and a lot of your faces, yes. Um, and thanks for Ingrid and Robin for um, hosting this. And I kind of say that Ingrid pulled me in and suckered me in. Uh, I have, it says uh, yes on the forehead. Um, I, I want to let you know that I'm not schooled in plants, native plants. I just do a lot of research. Um, I have my land. I would try to promote plants. I didn't have a degree in science or ecology. I just, it was my passion, so I would read. So I like to tell people that, and kids, because you can learn anything if you put your mind to it. Um, talking about my day today, well, uh, we had over $4,000 worth of native plants come in today from our online, we had an online native plant sale. And so all those plants were delivered today. So we had to divvy them up into groups ordered what so that's what I did for like two and a half hours today so and I have some plants that I got to go pick up after this because I didn't want them to burn out in my car so I have to take those um, back I do do um Barofi Lodge and I know about Barofi Lodge out in Ohio I, I do native plantings out there and pull out all those stinking invasives and so um I, some of those are from there um so I know some of you know about a few. How many of you know about a few? Okay. And we, we do lots of programming and I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, okay, my next slide. So that's just the beginning. Let's see if this will work. <laughs> Yeah, it should. Is it just the, oh, I don't see.
<laughs> this is what I, I got here early because I you know technology was like, Ugh. And let me introduce Thomas, who is the reason that this is on Facebook and YouTube and Zoom. And so I'll, I'll, I guess I'll just talk a little bit about a few. Um, yeah, so we started in 1990. It's an educational group. And um, we have a big Earth Day. We have the beekeepers that come and have a booth. And we do lots of programming there and hikes and things like that. Um, we pull out invasive plant species out of Cartier Park. We don't say we eradicate anymore because there's no eradication. Yeah. Oh, okay. Is that the right slide? Yeah, okay. yes. And uh, so, yeah, okay, going back to what a few is about, I started it with Kate Steggy. Uh, my dad had cancer and a mutual friend had cancer, so we felt like we needed to do something. So we started a group and Kate came up with the name A Few and it was kind of a joke, but it's been really good because it's the being that we start with the letter A, we're always at the top of the list. So that's good. Um, and uh, so, yeah, we've done na the native plant sale that's uh, Sarah Boland's in charge of that. Thank goodness she's very organized and we we really increased that uh, sale. The Earth Day celebration, we've been doing that. Um, so we've been around 33 years. So in two years, we really have to do a big thing. Beach sweeps, we do four beach sweeps. The invasive plant species. And then the U Diggit Community Garden uh, merged with us a couple of years ago. And there's there are maybe 30 beds. Now we have like 63 beds in there and raised beds. And some are for people to rent. And they plant their own plants like Lynn here. And then some people sponsor or raise food for the Lakeshore Food Club. And, um, and then we have the youth summer series and I do that. Um, so it'll be the third year. I do um, gardening, organic gardening with the kids and nature and um, art, art, because art, I taught art. And um, so that we have that program going on and, and a lot of the stuff you can find on our website. And we have a Facebook group and a page. So there's our mission there. And as um, Ingrid talked about the Cox Award, um, it was because of Marie here who was <laughs> put that in and she got that going. And so that was amazing. And so we had, we, uh, I was awarded $15,000 to give to the group. And so we had the Snakes Alive program this, this last spring. And so Michigan Snakes went to every fourth grader program to every fourth grader in Mason County. So that was really cool. Yes. So hoping to do that again. Uh, oh, the big the big news is that, um, oh, I have secured and have been cleared and a few has been cleared and we have been cleared from the White House to have the national FEMA director come and talk on June 27th to West Shore at 2 p.m. I just got the clearance all set today. And she's gonna talk about climate change and disasters and how it is affect. She was speaking at the UN and I, I kind of know her uncle. So I just messaged him and he said, oh yeah, we can, we can, uh, yeah, I'll get her. I'll get her. She's from Manistee actually, but I, I'm so excited about that. So now I've really got my work cut out for me. So pollinators, um, imagine a world without cotton t-shirts, chocolate bars, bananas, pumpkins, et cetera, et cetera. One out of every three of your mouthfuls you eat or drink would not exist without pollinators. So that's, we really need those pollinators. Yes. They're disappearing. Uh, 220,000 worldwide pollinators have been have disappeared. So that's quite a few. And we have changed the land, building, farming, and we've introduced many non-natives and things like that. So we need to think globally and act locally. And uh, so we have different pollinators there. And a pollinator is anything that helps carry pollen from the male part of the flower, the stamen, to the female part, the pistil. And the movement of pollen must occur in order for it to become fertilized and produce seeds and young plants. So uh, I also like to talk about what you can do to help with pollination. Of course, plant native plants, pollinator gardens, um, fill a bird bath. 
to attract the bird, you know, the birds or the, the bees and the butterflies need those. And there's other container, I brought a container over there. It's just um, a little tin and you can put rocks in it and uh, water and sand. And then the butterflies will come around and we put the rocks in there so they can land on there. So there's directions on how to do that. And don't use chemicals or, or pesticides. Yeah, that's, uh, that's not good for us either. So the bees, the most common are the ground and nesting bees. And I know we have some beekeepers here. I don't know that much about bees, but I was learning. And those posters up there have a lot of information about bees and there's cavity bee, nesting bees and ground. And they can visit up to 240 flowers in one trip. So you hear that term busy as a bee, that's where that came from. And bees leave their nests to connect nectar from sweet smelling bright flowers, usually blue or yellow. Some land and walk around as they suck nectar and with their tongues and then others hover while they visit shallow blossoms like flocks. We have flocks over there, prairie flocks. They collect pollen on their back legs or feathers, feather like hairs that cover their bodies. And they can carry nectar and some pollen back to feed the next generation of bees. And the nectar is used to make honey. So we have, um, that's a butterfly weed on the top there. The birds, the hummingbird is the one that does a lot of the pollination for birds. Um, and they love bee balm and columbine um, is a real good one. They use their long beak and brush like tongue to reach down into the flower and sip nectar. And when a bird, you know, other birds, they stop to by the flower to eat nectar and the pollen gets attached to its beak and the feathers. And then that bird goes from one flower to the next. So that's, you know, creating more of that pollination. Uh, birds that eat insects off flowers also contribute to pollination. And butterflies, and, and so the, there's a hummingbird on the cardinal flower. That's one of my, those are, of course, uh, the butterfly weed on the top and the, the cardinal flower on the bottom is my favorite. Um, at Barofi Lodge, we planted about 100 of those butter, uh, the um, cardinal flowers in a circle. And it is just amazing when those mm -hmm. are flowering and the hummingbirds are all coming around. The butterflies and moss, they, they like open petals. So they can land to get the nectar and the moss pollinate at night. They both have a uh, proboscis to collect nectar as they brush up against the flowers pollen covered anthers as pollen sticks to their bodies and they carry it to flowers. And then insects, beetles, they're clumsy when they fly. So they go to areas with plenty of room and the pollen is part of their diet. Flies, we love, you know, we don't think about flies as being pollinators, but they're attracted to odors that we don't usually smell. But they do like to smell, they smell um, decaying meat, things like that. The odors are made by the flower to trick the flies into visiting them and collect pollen on, on, its, on their bodies. And then bats, uh, we don't think of bats around, there's not many bats around here. There would be a more in the tropics and they have long, the ones with the long snout. So you afraid of bats or no, a no, bat no, woman? No, no, we just see a bear though. But. Yeah, uh, yeah, I had them in my house. I had them in my house. I finally got them out of my house. They're in my barn and I had, you know, but they don't do a lot of the pollination. No, well, the ones around here were, yeah. So isn't that gorgeous? What is a native plant? A native plant are indigenous terrestrial and aquatic species that have evolved and occurred naturally in a particular region, ecosystem and habitat. Species to nat native to North America are generally recognized as those occurring on the continent prior to, prior to the European settlement. That's, that's the big thing. So I guess we got a pointer here. I don't know which one is the pointer. Is that the top? Oh, shoot. <laughs> there we go. That's not the pointer. Maybe I don't know which one is the pointer. Okay. Well, the, the echinacea is the pink and the 
um, the, the milkweed. Boy, have you seen lots of milkweed this year? Yeah. Lots. I mean, and we didn't plant it. I mean, it's incredible. The other thing I've noticed is a lot of yarrow around more so than usual. So um, looks like some flax in the back and the black eyed Susan. Okay, why plant natives? Well, we know that they're good for the pollinators. And um, Doug Ptolemy is the big um, guru on native plants. He's written uh, um, the Bringing Nature's Nature Home Nature. and yeah, that one and Bringing Nature Home. Those are two really good ones. And some of the students performed a study that states that at least we, we need at least 70% of our area to be covered with native plants. So it's not, we can still plant non-native, but if we want to attract the pollinators and help them out, um, and the, the native plants provide food for the pollinators, um, they, they're often resistant to disease and pests, so you don't have to uh, worry so much about that. You know, you might see some insects eating some of your plants, but it, it kind of balances it out. It, they improve water, uh, air quality. There's that, uh, we know that plants will take in the carbon and, and help with that. They attract the beneficial insects and, and the beneficial insects, you know, that, that we need to pollinate and also for our, if you do if you're doing vegetables uh, the the one slide in the middle where it has um, the roots going down you can see the one in the one uh, strip that's yellow that's a lawn they don't have much root system and all the other ones are native and they really go a long way so that helps with um, if, if, if you're having a drought like this year, yeah. you know, they can go down, they'll just keep growing and they can get the water. Or in the case of when we had the high water with the, the Lake Michigan, you know, just a couple of years ago, we, we kind of forget that this year, but um, mm -hmm. they will help stabilize that with those long roots. And I know we planted a, uh, quite a few native seedlings, trees out of Barothi along the river because the river, was getting pretty high, the Pierre Marquette River. And so for every major rain event, each seedling would uh, soak up like 20 gallons of water. So as they get older, they soak up more and more. Uh, they don't need fertilizer, so that you don't have to use the chemicals. I mean, some people feel like they need to use the fertilizer and they're, they're used to living in this kind, you know, local conditions. So you can plant them right around here. That's what they're, they're made for. And I already said, pre prevent water runoff and you don't have to water them as much. I always say you need to get them established like the first year, especially, but now, you, you know, if you had them for a year or so, I mean, I do water mine still, but not as much as I would a regular plant. There's a lot, a lot less, um, uh, upkeep with them. Right. And then, um, let's see. Oh, the bottom one is no cultivars. And cultivars are, oh, you might find um, a cultivar might say uh, autumn blaze or something like that on the tag. And some of those plants, the, the, it's still out there. They're checking it out whether or not the birds or the, the butterflies or the, some of the bees will come to the cultivars. Mm -hmm. Some of them will, like if they change the color. So I say it's just better to go straight native. And because um, we don't, you know, some, some scientists say they're not really good for them. So, so the, the wild ones is in Grand Rapids all the beautiful plants and the cardinal plant. Can you tell I like cardinal plants and <laughs> butterfly weed? And so some of you might think, oh gosh, where, where do I start? You know, how do I, I always tell people to uh, start small, do a little bit. And 
Oh, say you have a section over here that's got a lot of grass or a lot of weeds. You know, if you put down layers, like seven layers of newspaper and then put mulch over it to let it um, uh, kill the weeds, that's a, that's a good start. Or cardboard, I do cardboard on my garden with mulch or straw. And then, um, so you have to think about how big you want your garden to be. Um, you know, I have a pretty big native plant area, but I just plant over the years and I just keep adding plants. You have to think about, and this is with any kind of landscaping, mm -hmm. you have to think about if there's much sun. So with native plants, I tell people, you know, there's some that really, a lot of native plants need a lot of sun. And the ones that we have up, up there need more sun, but I have found that if you get a plant that needs a lot of sun and you don't get that much sun, then uh, it just won't flower as much or it won't grow as fast. Let's see. Um, full sun would be six hours of sun. If it says uh, on, if it says uh, six, if it says full sun. So on, on the first table there, we made copies of the a few native plant um, list, yeah. And this is on our website also, it's a little tricky to find, but on there it shows how tall it gets, it says sun, partial shade, full shade. So that's a good, good key to look at. Um, partial sun, partial uh, shade, it's four to six hours and shade, there are some shade plants. Um, like wild ginger and columbine is a good shade plant. Um, prairie rose, or prairie smoke. I'm sorry, but there are there are some, and there are ground covers that you can add. Um, so soil type. You need to think about your soil type. Do you have sand? You know, around, around Lake Michigan, we have a lot of sand. So I like to add a little bit of. Uh, like earth dropping, you know, earth ca uh, earthworm castings or a little bit of compost. You don't have to, but it would look probably do better. And loam is like a combination. And then clay, if you have clay, you would need to add compost to that to help it uh, break up. And then moisture, there are plants that like a lot of moisture, like a wetland plant, or I don't know if you ever heard of rain gardens. Rain gardens, um, rain gardens are, are usually, um, they capture, they might capture uh, some of the rain that comes off of a parking lot. They're kind of a big thing now in cities. Um, we had one out at West Shore, but they ended up getting rid of it eventually. But it, it, there are certain plants that, native plants that will clean the water as it goes down. Instead of it going into a sewer, or the, the drain, it helps clean clean the water. So those kind of plants, um, there are certain plants on that sheet, it says what kind of plants would be good for moisture. And wetland area like cardinal plants and um, the blue lobelia are good and Joe pie weed, there's, and again, that, that's a good guide there. And then we have another guide over there that you can look at, actually you can just um, click on it, you know, take a picture of it. Or I told um, Ingrid I could send links of different things to look at. There's all kinds of information out there. And then you also have to, so uh, you have to think about, yeah, the moisture and like some of the plants could handle some drier area, but you would want to water them more. So like the cardinal plant, I have some cardinal plants and I just water it more than I would if, you know, it, they like a little bit more moist area. Color choices, you have to think about what colors you like. Um, it's always good to do complementary colors. It makes things pop out like yellow and purple. If you put those in, orange and blue are complementary colors. Red and green, you know, those are complementary colors. So if you put them near each other, then they pop out more. 
and height, um, you also have to think about how tall you want things. And, and with, with landscaping, you want to have the taller plants in the back. So you also want to keep that in mind. Um, although with um, some plants, if there's plants that are falling over quite a bit, you can either stake them up or you can cut them and then they'll bush out more if you need them to be a little shorter. Same with uh, bushes. You know, if some bush said it's going to be, you know, like six feet tall, you can always prune it. Uh, let's see. You want to think about um, critters. And on, on the front table, uh, Ingrid copied a, a, a page of plants that are supposedly deer resistant. And a lot of times now, uh, if you go to the nursery or something, it does say deer resistant. However, there are plants that, you know, with all my landscaping, you know, the hostas were like deer candy for the, you know, over there and over here, they, were, they weren't touched. So it, it just depends. You just have to kind of play around with it. I um, had a couple honeysuckle bushes that were eaten by some deer. And then I use um, plant skid, which is like blood, a blood mixture. And Josh, I don't know if you ever, anybody ever did any workshops with Josh Shields. He's, uh, he's got his PhD in trees and plants. And he says that um, deer are attracted to anything with food in it, like liquid fence, or anything with eggs. So plant skid is the one. <laughs> he, he swears by that. And, and you use mill organite. Yeah. And sometimes that works. And I, it so works for you. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Works for yeah. And it kind of depends on how enclosed your area is. You know, you just have to kind of play around with it. And I always say also to um, rotate, you know, maybe use a little mill, mill organite and then use the plant skid. And, things like that, but there are plants that they don't like. So, um, and then you, there are different, different um, types of plants. There's trees, you know, we, you know, the oak tree and things like that and shrubs. I don't know if any of you have done the soil conservation district. They, they sell a lot of native uh, trees and shrubs and, and then the, the perennials of plants. And the plugs, that's what we have here today. And the grasses, grasses are always good. The deer don't like those. Right, they don't. <laughs> yeah, except the grasses do need some sun. And, you know, you might get a grass that's only this big with our native plants. So we had some grasses this big and I planted quite a few of them and they've gotten pretty big and yeah, they're beautiful. Yeah, did you get some, Lynn? I did. Yeah, a couple of years. And then you could do seeds and there's, Different ways to start the seeds. You have to be patient, but you can do, um, we did winter sowing and you take the seeds and put them in jugs and like milk jugs and you cut open a little bit of it. And then did Marie, you were there for that. Yeah. It worked. Yeah, it worked. Yeah. And so you just let them be outside. The snow gets on them a little bit and then they start coming up and the only thing with that, it's slower. So you can't just, you know, usually they're little and you can't just plant them out there. You have to kind of put them in a different pot and be patient and then eventually transplant. Did you have success with that? And well, I, I had my dad said he made in mine mm -hmm. and I just planted them, the mine straight into my flower bed a couple of days ago. So after yeah. two weeks of their fill I have some that I water. I have some that I started last year and they're about this big. So I'm kind of waiting because otherwise I might think, oh, it's a weed, you know, I'll accidentally pull it. Yeah, that's harder. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but yeah. I didn't have any touch. I just left it out on the porch. Yeah, and yeah, it's great. Winter so I wouldn't normally have had water it, but this year I'd look in the hole and say, oh, they look kind of wealthy. And so yeah, it yeah, right. right. And there's also seed balls you wrap up, but you put seed in with um, compost and clay and, and some dirt, and then you put those into the ground. And if you're going to do seeds, I mean, just scatter seeds, fall is the best time for doing that. Like if you're going to do uh, native grass seed, you know, because there's more, much more um, 
water, hopefully, in the in the fall. Uh, let's see. It, uh, a general rule of thumb for landscaping is to um, buy in odd numbers or plant in odd numbers one, three, five, something like that, and kind of scatter them. There are some, some plants that do like to spread. Jacob's Ladder, I planted some of that and it's got a real pretty uh, blue flower in the, in the spring and it's all over. So I've been giving that away to a lot of people and Bee Balm does do that too, it, it, but it's nice, you know. Spider wart, there's spider wart, there's a non-native spider wart, but there's another spider wart, so. Um, Good ones to start with are, uh, but, well, the butterfly weed, the cone flower, blazing star, black eyed Susan, bee balm, coreopsis, Virginia bluebell. Oh, I'm getting ahead of, no, I guess I'm okay. Well, maybe I should go back to that, I don't know. So there's the different soil types. So we, probably know about soil. Mm -hmm. And where do you get native plants? Well, that is me with Matt Lamore, who owns Black Cap Nursery. And Ingrid and I took a little trip up there Monday and uh, picked out plants. And she also bought some plants for her to sell. Too many. Yes, yes, I know. I was good. I didn't buy any because I knew I was getting some today. I just couldn't remember which ones. And then we have our plant sale. And like I said, this year it was an online plant sale. We did have a program on native plants to kind of get that going. And um, we used to have it in Rotary Park in June, but uh, the plants came in. The guy, uh, Garrett, didn't want to spend that much time in the park because he's growing. He has other plant sales, but he's He's really good. Uh, Four Seasons uh, is up in Traverse. They don't have all natives, but Black Cap is all native. Four mm -hmm. Seasons has a section of natives. And those posters there, I picked those up um, at, at Four Seasons a few years ago, and they got all their information from Heather Holm, who is a big, another native plant gal. And uh, Ingrid got a, ordered a book Couple was it a couple books? Or? Yeah, we just added um, seven books or six books to the three to Ludington and three to um, to Scottville. This is hers. It's called Pollinators of Native Plants. So that one's in Scottville. Mm -hmm. See, yeah. And then Wild Type is in Mason. I've never been there. Um, I think that's Vern Roberts has that. And then Prairie Nursery, um, that's even at Prairie Nursery is, I just get their catalog and you order it and then they send it. And it's a good um, catalog even just to order, just to look at native plants, you know, because it's hard to know what you want to get unless you see them. Now, if you go up to Black Cap, he has pictures. By, have you gone up to Black Cap? Yeah, it's like, oh. Right. I have to I have to weed my native plants before I get any more. Um, <laughs> but he has pictures of all the plants. If I remember right, you can. I think he has them separated by like drier soil. Yes. Soil. Yep. He so does. Yeah. And part. and shade. He yep. has a big section of shade. And then Stan Tech is in Indiana. It used to be. Um, oh gosh, Cardinal. And they they you can order. I have ordered flats from them. And they also do restoration and they do prairies and things like that. Now, West Shore was community college was talking about doing um, some prairie out there mm -hmm. where instead of mowing and I connected them with uh, Stan Tech because they will come out and do the work if you want to. But they, they also have a lot of native plants. But so, uh, yeah, Matt just started wanting, he used to be a teacher and he just decided, well, there's no place to get native plants. So he just started growing them. And he gets uh, some of his things from Garrett and Garrett is who we get them from. And that's Birdsfoot Nursery. However, 
Now, um, I don't know if anybody of, of you heard about um, the Momentum Award. They had, you know, or they, they get, I don't know, $15,000. Yes. And, and the, the winner of this year's was Sidestep Farm. And they have native plants that they're starting to grow. So I recently connected with them and I'm going to hopefully meet with them. And I think they're going to do vegetables too, but that's, that's cool to have, you know, native plants are really growing. It's a big thing. So over there is the bee bomb, of course, with the, the butterfly weed, but I love both of those. Mm -hmm. And the bee bomb, you'll see that along the roads out in the country. It smells really good. It's just a funky little, little flower. So, you know, because of my environmental passion, I always have to put something in there about this. And so, um, <laughs> I'm just talking about paper talking. No, I know. I know. We are, we were talking about how to get these plugs. These are all called plugs, how to give plugs out to everybody that's here. And, and Ingrid said, oh, we have some peat pots at the library left over that she found. And I'm going, oh, peat's not that good. But, you know, you have to, you, you've got to use them. And, and a lot of people still use peat moss, but it's um, peat bogs make up only 3% of the earth's surface, but store 30% of land-based carbon. And unlike trees and grasslands, they can burn in wildfires rel relatively and release the carbon and peat lands tame wildfires. So, and there's a lot of peat moss or peat bogs up in Canada, which is hopefully good, but 90% of peat uh, bogs are gone already mm -hmm. uh, in the world. So, and they don't replenish themselves very easy, very quickly. So harvesting is, isn't really good. And, and also when they harvest them, they bring out all this equipment and they're taking it off. And so it's just not good. So there is an alternative. If you wanna really use something like peat moss, it's called um, pit moss over on the right there. I don't know if anybody ever listens to Jill Gardner. Joe Lamp Gardner mm -hmm. podcast. I, I love him. He's also on PBS, but he had a whole program on pit, pit, peat moss and pit moss. Um, I had a meeting with Dave Dempsey, who is a big environmentalist. He's written like nine books and he came to our Earth Day and had, you know, talked to everybody. And, and uh, I had a meeting, I met with him last week and he, I was telling him about this program coming up. He goes, oh, well, think about you know, you might want to talk to them about water usage, you know, not to use, not to water your plants, you know, in the middle of the day, because it just evaporates the timing. Uh, don't use chemicals unless you really need to. Yes. I've, I've used a lot of neem over the years, um, neem oil. It's organic, you can buy it at Lowe's and it's concentrated, so it's good to, it's like a fungicide and uh, pesticide and there's different ways you know like people get a hold of me well how do I get a hold of how do I get rid of these weeds you know you can do vinegar and salt things like that but it kills everything around and you can use your muscles and but we you know I mean plants I went over to Dawn's house one of our board members today to look at some of her work and she put plastic over all these plants and the plant the Plants are coming up through the plastic, and there's it was a spider wart, and it was it was she's had it covered like for three weeks, black plastic, and it's still growing. It's green, mm -hmm. but then right in the alley, there's you know weeds coming up through the blacktop. So all those you know they say every weed, every plant is not a weed. I mean, you just have to find a good use for it. But um, way to remove the leaves in I don't, I don't um, rake at all until spring. And they say to wait around it to be like 50 degrees consistently because there are a lot of insects, moss and the chrysalises that are in the leaves. 
And then with the stems, a lot of the, bee, the bees, you know, stay in there. And so you don't want to cut anything down. I, some people like over here, well, here's, here's a picture. Of, it looks like a leaf almost, but you could find that possibly in your leaves. And the gal that we had uh, come and talk about native plants, she was um, saying that, you know, how some people shred up their leaves. You know, you could be shredding up chrysalises. So um, I just put them in a big pile and let them just break down. But I do it when it gets the temperature to be right. And then over there is, you know, in the snow with all the stems sticking out. And some people, I had one, one woman that I used to landscape for and she did not like anything brown. She didn't even like to wear brown. So I had to cut everything down. <laughs> And then another one was just, oh yeah, just leave it all, you know. And it, it's a matter of choice, but when you find out why it's so important just to leave them up, you, you know, you think about that. So, and if you want to use, you know, uh, fertilizer, there's some choices there. I did actually, well, there's a gal, I don't know if Elena Warson, who grows worms and does the worm castings. Did any of you guys go up there? Gone up there okay. She did a workshop, but they had a uh, Sarah Bowl and organized a little uh, tour up there. And but you can get and I bought some earth uh, earthworm castings at Costco. You know, they're organic, so it's it's coming around. More and more people are getting on board. So shrink your lawn. You don't need all that lawn. You know, I mean, how many people? actually go out on it you know we, we play croquet anymore i don't know <laughs> i always think about croquet on the lawn but um and there were you know there's some towns that are doing that no mow may so that some of the flower other weeds and flowers that can attract the bees help the bees out and conserve energy so um we need to slow down global warming because the birds, there's more and more birds that are coming south. Oh, recording in progress. Because it's too warm there. And then also if the, the plants are starting to flower and whatnot, grow up before the birds are here, they don't get what they need. So by slowing everything down, we can help. The, the pollinators, the birds. <laughs> I thought it. Uh, I I've never spelled that before. Right I so, definitely did. I've never spelled that before. Right. We can join. Was, we can, like, yeah. Any questions? Join the uh, and just say, "Is that how you spell P?" Yeah. <laughs> okay. yeah. No questions. It'll be great. <laughs> There'll be a quiz. Former teacher, you know. Um, yeah. What's up with plants over there? What oh, what's up with the plants over there? Yeah. I was going to get to that. I was just waiting to see if there were any questions. So with this program, um, it was advertised that you get to take a plant. So there are plants over there. There's uh, golden Alexander. This has a delicate yellow flower. It gets to be pretty big, but it gets to be pretty tall, mm -hmm. like that. And this is a, a blue aster, mm -hmm. and it has a indigo type flower. It gets to be you know, like that. Look at this very black. So these are all for drier areas. Okay. And then we have the great uh, blue lobelia. Mm -hmm. And that can get to be like about this. And these are. It does better when it's wetter. I have some in my yard and I just water them more. And then the cardinal plant, that's the red one that I love. I haven't seen. And then, um, yeah, if you did pick up one of those uh, sheets of, you know, what viewers have. That's a good guide to look at. And also, I think I believe it's still up on our website. So if you're looking, and if you go to one of the, you know, if you go to Black Camp, he will guide you to what you want. Yep. Are you familiar with the planting and the legacy product? 
Uh, yeah, some of them. That summer they had a flowering plant that really was attracting butterflies. Mm -hmm. You know what that was? By any chance? Was it orange? She was orange. Yeah, it was a butterfly. Yeah. yeah. You know, I have to put in a plug for butterfly bush or an unplug because the butterfly bush, which is with the, usually the purple, the star, you know, the pointed flowers, um, <clears throat> they can support the butterflies, but they can't support the eggs that, you know, if they lay eggs on there, then the eggs, the, the caterpillars can't eat that. So that's why the milkweeds are good for that. So, yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because it really, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. There's just as I'm putting this together, I have so much, you know, folders and put and information and links, and it's like, yeah. Oh. <laughs> We have to ask specific questions, but we don't know what to, how to ask specific questions. So. And, <laughs> you can, yeah, yeah. Um, the peat moss alternative, what is that? It's called pit moss. Yeah, oh, uh, I think they have some cellulose in there, some newspapers and things like that. If you go to that website, they would tell you. I can't off the hand, you know, I haven't gotten any. But um, it's supposed to be really good. And, and then there's coconut core is another alternative, but I was listening to a podcast on that and that has some salt in it. So it, it might damage your plants. So I haven't used either one of them. I, uh, yeah. Do you know, I'm just curious, you, know, you can go to like an acres co-op down here and get like mm -hmm. the Michigan roadside mix. And that's the stuff like they actually plant in the verges. You can get it for like bigger areas of property. Do you know if they're putting any like natives into that roadside mix that they use? All I, you know, I don't know, but that would be good to check. Um, we were giving away, one of our board members bought a bunch of native or wildflower seeds to give away. And Dave Dister, who is the big guru, the botanist, who is, knows everything about plants, he looked on the packet and saw, oh, there's uh, baby's breath in here. So those wildflower mixes, you have to be very careful because a lot of those plants are invasive. Lenny, did you have a? Yes, I do have the wildflower mix things to give out. Oh. And on the back is what was actually in the package. We, we free. Okay, okay well, we should people. look, we should look and see. Can I look at what's in there? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I know it, it, it's a curse. Once you know, once you learn about invasive plants, you just like, oh. Well, but a lot of some of these invasive plants can change the soil. The third week of every month. Yeah, the only thing that might be a problem is partridge pea, but I think that's okay. There are there are there are non-native plants that are not invasive. So and it's okay to still have those, but you know, like Doug Ptolemy's students said you should have 70% native. Part of what I was asking too with the, the question about the, the roadside mix is that DNR actually uses that like on the bridge and all that, which is I thought would be a good name. You might know if there was anything like that or like Sorry. advocacy for like where there's a statewide kind of thing where they're scattering seed all over, like if they're able to like have that be like. What was that question? Can you repeat? Can you hit Julie? Oh, can I repeat it? Yeah. Um, what was that well, do you want to just talk louder? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, I was just sort of like doubling back to that saying that with the like the DNR using that, um, like literally called the Michigan Roadside Mix that they scatter them like the birds and all those. Yeah, well, I was just curious, I thought that you might know, I mean, like what's what's yeah. doing that or whether there's like kind of like what this advocate for, I mean, they're just sticking up like, all over all the time. I would like, hope they would they, spread. Yeah, I, I hope they don't use non-native. I mean, yeah. I think more and more people are becoming aware of the invasives and the importance of native. Yeah. But there's still, and, and, you know, the milkweed, I mean, that, look at how much that has gone, you know, people used to just chop it all down. I have a question that's not related to the plant itself, but rather to mulch. You know, there's so many different colors of mulch available. And I'm wondering, are there chemicals that color that mulch that could be harmful? 
Yeah, the red and the black. Yeah, yes. Yeah. And so I did some research on that. One of my clients wanted the red and I talked her out of the red. And then guess what she ordered? She ordered the black. It's like, oh, she, she was trying, you know. She, um, so what I read was, well, it is, the red is like an iron. So it's not that bad. And the black, I don't know what, I can't remember. It's been a while. I've been retired from that for a while, but what I read was it depends on what kind of wood it is that you don't want to get uh, mulch that is made from like plywood and scrap wood, you know, or womanized wood, you know, it's mm -hmm. once you start looking at all this stuff, it's just, I, I have a lot of sleepless nights. So, <laughs> what, what that? so I would do cedar or natural, you know, I just hope that it's not, you know, and for me, I order. I mean, I know everybody can't do this. I would order um, a big truckload or something like that instead of the flat, the bagged mulch because of the plastic. But yeah, um, I know that years ago uh, in the eighties, I had a garden and I went to a garden center and bought purple loosestrife, which is horrible oh. invasive. What's have they been able to control that? Better, there, there was a beetle that was uh, eating that, or and and it they did it did go away quite a bit, but I think it's starting to come back a little bit. So yeah, you see that on the roadside. Yeah. Problem with that beetle. Pardon? Out of control, it started eating other plants than what it's supposed to. The beetle. Did, yeah. yeah, that's the, that's the the bar the bad thing about inviting yeah bringing in other ones. You really have to be careful about that. Um. Yeah, and like, well, garlic, the ones that we, we try to pull out are like garlic mustard in, in um, Cartier Park. There's lots of that oriental bittersweet. Dame's Rocket is, is blooming right now. Garlic mustard and Dame's Rocket, they're in the mustard family, and they change the soil so that nothing else can grow there. Or Phragmites on lakes, I don't, you know, you see it in the ditches and stuff like that. Phragmites will take over the cattails and you know, other critters can't live in there. So it's, it's, we're never going to get rid of the invasives, but we, we can try to slow it down or I guess it makes us feel better. Like the autumn olives. Oh yes. That was, yeah, that was sold out, sold to everybody in the seventies. Yeah. We have so much of it. And so this one lady told me that um, the birds eat the berries and yes. it's kind of like crack for them. They just kind of, yeah. It gets them going and going and going, and then they just drop. It's like you know, eating lots of candy and sugar, and then you just kind of drop. So raccoons too. Raccoons like it. Right. Yes, the berries. Mm -hmm. Why? Well, and I think you can. I've heard you can make jam out of it. <laughs> we made. I made paper out of garlic mustard one year. It took a lot of garlic mustard, but it was pretty cool paper, green. Well, thank you for thank caring. You. And if you if you have any questions, feel free to contact me. I do, you know, I go visit other places. How you know they're give them some pointers. We know where to live. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so thank you so much, thank you. Julia. For yes, thank you for speaking along. Thank you to Lenny for um. He is the founder of the Arizona River. River. What's that? You like to get the kids by the unit. Do you have young grandkids or kids? I have a food coloring book. They will know a lot about it. As well, from all the uh, pictures of them. So, if anybody would like to do a coloring book, I got them. I brought them. Thank you. The next, our next, oh, and thank you to Thomas and Chris for getting this. Yeah. Woo. My blood pressure was. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, our next, the third part of the series is back in Scottville um, on July 5th. Um, Wednesday, July 5th, the first Wednesday in July. And that is two of our beekeepers from Scottville Beekeepers, the, the Candace Ginn and um, Ann Nauer are going to be teaching us how to make chapstick, uh, lip balm using their own wax, uh, beeswax from their own hives. And we are going to have samples of honey that you can taste. And we're also going to have a wrap for that. So please come out for the third part of the series for that, the first July 5th. Thank you. Um, we're really excited for that. Yeah. So Julia has very graciously figured out she's labeled over here, like if you want plants that you have to water more, that need shade or that need sun, 
Um, so please help yourself take one of those plants that you would like thank in your you. home garden you. and plant thank that. You. So, and thank you for introducing me to Black Cat. It's so beautiful. I can't yeah. wait to go there. I'm like, it's just beautiful. Right. Yeah, that's exciting. So, so the question Thank you. So thank you. 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 Thank